Antarctica is a really special place. Uh, we as a, a company, as expedition staff, love coming down to the Antarctic. It is a very special place that uh, for many people on this voyage, uh, it, it will be a life-changing experience. This is somewhere that people come to for different reasons, sometimes not really knowing why they're coming here, but I think everyone goes away knowing why this place is so special, why we see it as being very special, and why it's somewhere that we need to protect for future generations. Every expedition down to Antarctica has to cross the Drake Passage, an often maligned, dreaded body of water that falls between the tip of Tierra del Fuego and the Antarctic continent itself. It's this particular aspect of our expedition that makes Antarctica so special. I now belong to the higher cult of mortals, for I have seen the albatross. Good morning from Marguerite Bay. It's about 5.30 on a rather cool day, but it's, uh, it's not rainy or too windy, and of course everyone should be dressed in their expedition attire. What's your stuff, please? Right here, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Antarctic. We made it. So we're here at our first landing in Red Rock Ridge. This is a continental landing and it's one of the most southerly landings on the Antarctic Peninsula. So we're really excited to be here. Uh, this ship and Lindblad Expeditions National Geographic hasn't been here since 2010. So it's a great landing. We've got some hiking going on behind us and we've also got a great Adelie penguin colony up here. The chicks are getting quite large, so there's plenty of action, people are having a great time and grabbing an Antarctic moment. Well, it does culminate all seven continents, so we're really excited to be here, and this is such a beautiful place. It's and, utterly amazing. And to be able to do the south of the Antarctic Circle just really epitomizes what we're really trying to accomplish. So it's just terrific to be in such a remote place. Just from watching for the last couple hours, it appears that the colony is quite healthy. Uh, there's not a lot of begging behavior from the chicks. The chicks are all quite plump and robust, very almost comical looking, um, but there's not a lot of begging from the chicks towards the parents for food, and that's indicative that they're healthy. 
and particularly since they're starting to molt, that's a very energetic time uh, for these penguins and their chicks going into their first molt. So they really need to have lots of fat reserves uh, built up so that they can spend that energy to replace those vital feathers um, that make them uh, the penguins they are today. I love the fact that the chicks are that gray color. They look kind of fuzzy. Uh, and I love to see them walk because they waddle. <laughs> beautiful um, to see them and to know that they're here. It's just amazing that they've made this their home and that we get to come see them. Yes, it is. Very nice. You're, you might get addicted. A lot of, a lot of people do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. This afternoon we're on Stonington Island and this is the site of a really fascinating historic British base. So there's been a British base here since the 1940s. Uh, the building that we see behind us here um, actually dates from the 1960s and was used up until 1975. And we're incredibly lucky to be here at the moment because while we're here, there is also a conservation team here from the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust and they're doing really important work to conserve the building that's here and also the artifacts inside it. So we're having a fascinating time speaking to them about the really important work that they're doing here. <laughs> this is Stonington Base, which I last visited in March 1973 and I sat precisely here while we drank tea after moving cargo. So we would unload at the shore load the cargoes onto nans and sledges and the dogs would haul the cargo on the sledges up to here when they would be manhandled into the store. After which we all sat around here keeping warm with the coal fire, drinking tea and actually listening to the record of the moment which was Carol King Tapestry and if that doesn't date me nothing will. There are a number of really special buildings down in this part of Antarctica, Detail Island, Horseshoe and Stonington and it's just great that they're being conserved by the Heritage Trust so that the next generation of people can see quite how these buildings were, at least to some extent how they were used, what they looked like, and maybe get a flavour of what life was like down there in those distant times. So today we were able to go further south than we ever have done in the past in the Marguerite Bay. And uh, it's not only uh, Limnod expeditions, it's so that uh, none of our competitors, none have been that far south in the peninsula. Uh, Marguerite Bay is uh, very remote and it's uh, often lots of sea ice and it's uh, there's only about every third season or so it's open up so we have an opportunity to go so far south but you never thought you'd be a sunglass model in antarctica <laughs> it's a fabulous view here just uh, stunning scenery all around us I, I really don't have words to describe it just 
kind of gobsmacked right now. <laughs> I mean, it's just a spectacular place and I would have been excited just going where, you know, everyone else kind of goes, but coming here is just unbelievable and such a cool experience. This is very important to be able to do a little of exploration. It's, uh, it's an challenging but also important because we, we do true expeditions. And then when it's ideal conditions and we have the time, we go and explore because that's our main mission, exploration. Did anyone check the latitude this morning? 68.44. So as you know, this is the furthest south the ship has ever been. Certainly the furthest south this boat has yeah. ever been. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously a lovely day. So the plan for today, there's a really massive, beautiful tabular iceberg just off the stern here. Did you see it from your cabin? We're gonna go take a quick tour of that. After that, we'll go into the pack ice here, see some beautiful icebergs up close. Why do I love ice? Must there be a why? <laughs> I like that it's this very abstract habitat. Had we not come down here, Antarctica is just like this Mars of the planet. And I think it really helps piece together how the planet works when you've seen ice and can put an emotional connection to it. Boy, it looks really pretty in the sun like this. So this is the purest air on the planet. This air was trapped in here before pollution was pollution. If anybody needs a breath of fresh air, we can pass this around. <laughs> Just pieces. I like thinking about what was happening on the planet when this ice surrounded the planet, or when that air surrounded the planet and that ice captured it. Ice like that, I don't know how people can come down here and not get entranced with the ice here. It's gorgeous. It's breathtaking. Just mind-boggling. <laughs> Uh, we got a six o'clock wake up call this morning to come out and see this beautiful pack ice that's out here. And uh, there are these large, large chunks and they're just floating around and you can see animal markings on the ice. And um, it's a little early in the morning, but definitely worth getting up for and, and seeing this. We could also see the icebreaker on the front of the ship and it's like a torpedo going out and it's just pushing us right straight through it. Here we are, parked. That's great, man. There's about 950 feet of water underneath us. <laughs> luckily, luckily there's about seven feet of ice between us and that, so we're doing okay. Well, sweetie, I guess we're not in the Galapagos anymore. <laughs> I'm rolling, go ahead. A N T C one. A. <laughs> Take two. A N T A R T. A R T. Go with it, go with it. Go with it. <laughs> How do I get up here? It's exactly like hot yoga, but different. <laughs> Still fresh. <laughs> As my wife Nancy said she wanted to go south this winter, 
and I always try to do what she wants. So I took her as far south as I could. Serving you Viking cocktails in form of hot chocolate. But you know, it's 5 p.m. in Europe already, so you can adulterate it a little bit with either peppermint schnapps, whiskey Kahlua, or frangelico liqueur. And as, as, as always, it's proven now that the Swedish Vikings are the friendly, caring, giving Vikings, not like the bloodthirsty Danes and Norwegians. Be good, don't do anything to your driver that the Vikings wouldn't have done. Perfect way to spend the day. It looks like a, a city made out of a city of ice. I'm Erica, your National Geographic photographer. And today we're going to be photographing my favorite subject out here, which is icebergs. And we are in what's called the Iceberg Graveyard. We have perfect lighting. <laughs> We have perfect lights, so this is pretty amazing. And the reason I say that, and let's hope it stays a little bit, so the clouds are kind of diffusing the light here, but this, look at this gray background. This is beautiful. Oh my goodness, look at that. How many? Are you seeing 20? I can't see. Oh my, oh yes, you're absolutely, yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 just snuck up on us. <laughs> Suddenly, we all went from landscape photographers see to uh, wildlife photographers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Will. Gentle. Oh. Oh. I think it doesn't get any better than this. Oh man, unbelievable. To have them like 30 feet away from you, just stunning. Truly, I think for many of our staff members, this area of the Antarctic Peninsula is uh, near and dear to our hearts. And we made our landing here at Booth Island, which forms uh, one of the boundaries of the uh, fabled Le Maire Channel. 
And there's a lot of history here at Booth Island, including history from uh, the explorations of Charcot himself, where the port gets its name. And uh, one fascinating aspect of our landing here at Booth Island is that all three species of brush-tailed penguins nest on this island. Uh, we have predominantly Gentoo penguins nesting here uh, with a smattering of chinstraps and Adelie penguins. And what's most interesting about that ratio is 30 years ago or so, the ratio would have been flipped completely on the other end. It would have been mostly chinstrap penguins nesting here and Adelies with a smattering of Gentoos. But due to changing climatic conditions here in this part of the peninsula in particular, is one of the fastest warming parts of the peninsula. And with that warming trend, uh, we see the change and shift in development and extent of sea ice formation. And both uh, the Adelie penguins in particular um, require that sea ice as a facet of their life history they depend on. And Gentoo penguins in particular are what we call near shore feeding penguins. And they don't venture far afield from their, from their nesting colonies. In fact, through the winter, they prefer not to go terribly far. So the, the more open water that's persisting here in the Antarctic Peninsula is just better conditions for Gentoo penguins and not as ideal for penguins like Adelie penguins and the chinstrap penguins. So the shift that we're seeing in the populations of the penguins in this region, uh, something that's been monitored over the course of the last few decades, and it is, it is an indicator of the, the warming climate that uh, Antarctica as a whole is facing, but here in particular uh, on the peninsula. Antarctic days, blue sky, sun shining, the snow, oh, it's wonderful. Mm. And unfortunately, on the way to Cape Renard, there was a lot of snow-covered, small snow-covered islands. Mm. They weren't very large, you know, so some only about 40 or 50 feet long, mm. and so but this snow-covered. And we went to Cape Renard, we put up the flag, everything and everybody re-embarked in the ship and we were returning to Port Macquarie. Jimmy Mars had asked me whether he, he could have a bath and so I said yes by all means have a bath mm -hmm. you know have to be salt water but that's mm -hmm. beside the point and so he went he was having a bath as we were coming along and I was on the bridge, and the officer of the watch um, leading over the side, and, and there was a few, what we saw, a few bits of ice mm -hmm. hanging around, not very much. And I saw a head with what looked like a piece of ice. I didn't pay a great deal of attention. Mm -hmm. no. And suddenly the officer of the watch leant over the side and said, My God, I can see the bottom. Just then there was an awful clang. Uh, where we hit the bottom rock. Luckily, we weren't going very far. Mm -hmm. Now, Jimmy Ma was in the middle of his bath, a lovely hot salt water bath, mm -hmm. and this clang, he thought, my God, the ship's sinking. He came rushing up in his birthday suit <laughs> up to the bridge. <laughs> anyway, uh, there was no damage done, and uh, we got back to Port Macquarie. So I haven't been here for over 30 years. 
We're visiting Port Lockroy, an, an old British Antarctic survey base, which closed in the 1960s, uh, which is now a uh, United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust site and British Post Office. This base is one of the old-fashioned Antarctic bases. Quite primitive in many respects, but as comfortable as you can make them. And when Andy and I started wintering in the Antarctic, there was a transition to a more modern, more comfortable base in many respects. This was the way it was up until, uh, well, yeah, Faraday, up until the mid-1970s. This, this is pretty much what Faraday was like before we rebuilt it in 1980. All the scientific programs had routines, and part of the art of survival for a winter is to let those routines guide your daily program, but also at the end of the day for everyone to meet in base, you know, to discuss how the day went, to have a drinks if necessary and a meal, um, th that social side. But really the pulse of the winter was based on your routines. And we were having a laugh because that, that beastie, that Ionosol, was part of that routine. It, went continuously for four minutes, every 15 minutes, and during that four minute period, there was no other radio would work on base because it would drown them out. And it would even catch up with electronic equipment or electrical equipment like phonographs and record players so you couldn't listen to music. For four minutes, every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It was just part of the routine. It was almost like a heartbeat in many respects. Well, of course, we're all warm and dry in our outfits, but I think you get a sense of what it was like uh, here. Sort of the ultimate uh, camp out. Currently out in the middle of the Gurlas Strait, and we found a group of Type A killer whales, largest of the killer whales we find down here in Antarctica. And we believe that they've made a kill, and that they're currently moving around, sharing the kill between them. That's why we're seeing some of these giant petrels around and other birds. We have a group of probably about 12 to 15 individuals, and we know these animals really well. We've seen them um, regularly for the past couple years. We were able to fly our hexacopter over them last year and get lots of great measurements. Unfortunately, it's a bit inclement today, so we won't be um, flying the drone, but we're able to get lots of photo identification images, which we um, use to, to monitor the population and see how they're doing. The different types of killer whales are um, in different health, if you like. Um, the type A killer whales that we're looking at here tend to be doing really well. They're robust, they're fat. Whether the type B1 and B2 killer whales that are more dependent on the ice, um, we found some of those individuals in poor condition. So we're trying to understand why that is, how widespread that is, um, if they're in poor condition every year or if it's just a, an unusual year. Um, and uh, you know, I think the combination of these, these type A killer whales looking in robust shape and increasing in abundance um, is, shows that they're doing pretty well at the moment. This is the largest predator in the ocean. Um, and uh, so if we can understand the, the status of the predator, it helps us understand the status of the food web beneath them. Pretty much indicative of how this entire trip has gone, where you can't possibly imagine it getting any better, and then it does.
We all come to the Antarctic for different reasons, but I think all of us goes home slightly changed, having seen such a pristine and beautiful place. It's very hard to leave that behind without feeling a sense of wonderment, a sense of how truly special this location is. Geographic Explorer. This is the furthest south the ship has ever been. I believe we're at 68 degrees 41 minutes south. And these people are going to do a polar plunge here in this frigid water. Right.
Oh my god, we're ready to go! Yeah. Oh.